You're listening to the Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. iwoca.co.uk. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello, Richard. Hello, Daniel. And somewhere, Lionel, are you there? Lionel Burney. Hello, chaps. A hand, a disembodied hand waves on this on the tiny screen. Hello, Lionel. Is there any reason why your camera is pointing at the ceiling? I can't, can't conceal my, his location. Can't, can't prop my phone up. Um, it keeps slipping, slipping down. So you can look at the look at the uh, spotlight on my ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. No uh, musical revelations uh, this this week. I'm afraid. Um, Daniel's back in his black polo neck looking kind of 007 like Daniel appropriately enough um he's in a secret location uh well listen this is our penultimate episode before Christmas isn't it we've got a very special one planned for next week um details probably follow next week um while I remember as well uh there will be an episode of service course as well before Christmas Lizzie Banks and Tom Wally and they're doing they're adopting stealing our press conference concept and they're asking for tech questions, any equipment questions, clothing, uh, anything at all related to the bike. Um, send send us in your questions. Contact at thecyclingpodcast.com, an audio file. I think Daniel might have one I did actually have questions. a question. I did actually have a question. Go on then. Um, I don't know if you saw pictures flying around online of, I think there's a Dutch company that's designed um, some handlebars that are very, very narrow. Yes. About, mm. I don't know how... Why they well, are maybe na- twenty narrow, centimeters? But also 30... got this long, straight s- section before the brake levers, don't they? Yeah, they're a bit of a hybrid between a, a, a um, time trial bar and normal road handlebars. Um, want to know is this the future, and how soon is the future going to arrive um, in the Pro Tour, in this or in the World Tour, in this form? Dan Bigham um, had quite a robust um, exchange on that with people who didn't like the aesthetics of it, I would include myself among those people, um, you know, basically arguing that aesthetics are irrelevant. Um, it's all about performance, and it's a performance sport. So forget the aesthetics. I don't know. I'm not sure I'd go along with that, Dan, if I'm honest. But, um, uh, well, just while the UCI are there as custodians of the, the aesthetics and everything else and the purity of the sport. It's, it's funny, Rich. I was reading an interview with um, Dario Cataldo, veteran um, Movistar he writes for now, um, Italian rider the other day. And he was talking about how it's quite a subject of conversation among older riders in the peloton and how equipment and advances in equipment are making making races too fast. Um, I don't know how you gauge. I don't know what <laughs> prompted him to, yeah. to um, you know, decide what the threshold was. But um, he, he said that he's even had conversations with colleagues about you know, how the UCI should further restrict, not just in terms of weight, but restrict um, aerodynamics on, on bikes. Um, in, uh, I mean, it sort of reminded me of the conversation that's been going on for years in golf about um, distances um, of the, the golf ball flies and, and how it makes it impossible to adapt courses to that. I mean, of course, in cycling, there's no, you know, there's no, no reason speed why limit. average there's speeds no speed shouldn't, be, shouldn't be 70 kilometers an hour. I mean, we tried that in the 90s and um, I think everyone enjoyed it. I mean, if you, well, if you, if it's too fast, it's probably maybe time to retire. Um, but on that, I think we're going to, we're going to be talking in this uh, week's episode a bit about Team Sunweb and their, their new sponsor for next year. And uh, we might hear a little bit from Mark Hershey, might we, Lionel? You spoke, you were part of his um, press conference, but Mark Hershey, oh, thumbs down. We're not going to hear from Mark Hershey, but we will hear from Nicholas Roach and uh, Ivan Speckenbrink, who's the, the man in charge there. And, I had a few messages from people during the tour about Hershey and the position that he adopted on the bike using his device, uh, which was a very large device mounted at the front of the handlebars as a sort of um, improvised tri bar setup. Um, and w- people wondering whether that was a kind of hack, that was a kind of way around the, the rules, basically, um, almost like spinaches, uh, but adopt being able to adopt that position have some security in that position by virtue of the device at the front of his handlebars but we're we're going down a bit of a rabbit hole here aren't we um it's it feels like silly season in, in cycling there's been an awful lot of news this last week big news as well and um, so maybe we should get straight into the news roundup because we do have a few interviews in this week's episode lionel 
Well, that's the opposite of silly season, isn't it? Silly season is uh, traditionally the August, isn't it? In newspaper All world, right, where sorry. very little going, silly, very little going silly on. Silly season police there. So, um, it's incredibly serious season this week with all the news that's going about. Uh, just um, you mentioned we've got an episode of Service Course coming up quickly or soon, sorry, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've also got an episode of Explore coming out later this week. Uh, Daniel, you might be interested. Do you remember Timmy Mallet? I've interviewed Timmy Mallet. Wow. The, uh, well, I named him a few Wack-a-day. weeks ago, didn't I? British children's tv star of the what late 80s and 90s um a big cycling fan uh, and, and has cycled uh, halfway across western europe uh, written a book about it as well he is uh, the subject of explore that will be out, out later this week and also richard the first of the two-part friends of the podcast episode that we won't spoiler mm. by revealing now what it's about but it's an, a, an absolute crack oh yeah it's been working. just thinking velon are missing a trick aren't they not not getting timmy mallet to be an ambassador of the hammer series <laughs> with his mallet's mallet <laughs> yeah, exactly this, this won't make sense to anyone who didn't watch Whackaday uh, or mallet's mallet in the 90s uh, but all will be revealed on explore uh, but rich crack on with the news shall we because uh, please uh, several of these things we're going to talk about in this episode uh, first of all mark cavendish is returning to de kerning quick step he rode for them from 2013 to 2015 when they were omega farmer quick step and then Etix Quick Step. He won 44 races for them, including three Tour de France stages, and he goes back there after a year with Bahrain McLaren. Uh, sticking with Bahrain McLaren, or rather not sticking with Bahrain McLaren, is Rod Ellingworth, who is going back as well. He's going to Ineos Grenadiers as director of racing. We'll talk about those two big moves in part uh, one of the podcast. Uh, you mentioned Sunweb. Uh, Richard, I wonder how long it will be before I get my head around their new I would name. I say 2023. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> well, Team DSM, they're going to be sponsored primarily by a Dutch-based multinational science company that has interests in nutrition, health and sustainability. And they've got a new blue jersey with uh, two pale blue stripes uh, on it, kind of keeping that uh, design from the Sunweb jersey, which was obviously white with the two black stripes on it, but uh, uh, reversing it and uh, adding some rather Team Sky-like pale blue stripes but uh so they will be team dsm must try and remember that maybe i'll write out a thousand times team dsm until it lodges in my brain uh, we're also going to hear from uh, sherry pridham who will become the first woman to work as a sports director in the world tour she is joining israel startup nation at the start of next season um, she's been a sports director for over a decade with Plowman Craven Madison, Team Rally, and most recently the Vitus team, which she also owned. Uh, back in our Giro in May, we featured Robin Morton, who had been sports director for the Gianni Motta team at the 1984 Giro. But this is a um, this is this is quite a, a step because it's the first woman working in that role in the World Tour, and we'll hear from Sherry in uh, I think part three of the podcast today some other news to wrap up Kubeka asos are we are we going with asos or asos or ah well asos anything's allowed mm, anything's allowed says <laughs> mr risotto um <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we actually had uh, someone on on twitter did take issue ben atkins i think it was took issue with daniel's pronunciation of asos in last week's podcast um, I, i've always said asos the asos were the the premium clothing uh, manufacturer in the 80s weren't they and, and still and still are obviously but um, they, they go back a long way and uh, their chief executive Derek Bouchard Hall uh, got in touch to um, say that well basically to say anything goes <laughs> very diplomatic um, but I'll, I'll stick with ASOS I think I'm going to stick with ASOS Daniel are you going to come over to our way of thinking here or are you going to stick with ASOS um, I'm usually very relaxed about these things so you're probably <laughs> You'll probably hear a variety of different pronunciations from me. <laughs> I'll tell you what, forward. Daniel, if it's before Going 11 a.m. That's not allowed either, is it? That phrase. <laughs> if it's before 11 a.m., you're allowed to say ASOS, but after that, it's got to be ASOS. Well, chaps, do, right? we want, that, that's do, we, do we want to talk about the actual serious business of the, the signings, or are we going to do that well, later? Well, we're going to get on to that. We're going to get Ke- on to that. Quebec at ASOS have, have really beefed up their roster. They've been signing riders two or three at a time over, it seems like, every day for the past week. Um, exaggerate only slightly, but 
They've added Fabio Aru, the 2015 Vuelta winner, who's had a difficult couple of years. He's had an iliac artery issue that has taken some time to get over. He didn't finish the Tour this year or the Vuelta last year, did he? But he did finish 14th in the Tour de France last year. But uh, Aru is a GC rider and, and will, uh, well, I mean... When we were talking last week about the riders that were on the market, he was probably the most eye-catching free agent uh, on that list. He's joined by Sergio Enel, former Team Sky and UAE Team Emirates rider, and also former Vuelta stage winner Sander Arme, who was with Lotto Sudal, is going there. But they've added a whole bunch of riders, and I think their roster, if it's not completely full... It is full, full now, yeah. Very, it's mm. full now, is it? Right, there we are. Sorry, Daniel. Well, it's been, it's been on Aru. a bit like an advent calendar, hasn't it? They have been announcing a new signing every day. Would you be happy to get a Fabio Aru on the 24th of December behind your little window, Napalm, maybe with a bit of chocolate? I think it's... Uh, Depends how much I chocolate... Think, <laughs> It depends. Yeah, well, it depends how much chocolate. I think, as I said last week, it's, uh, um, you know, they're, they're last in line at the buffet, aren't they? Um, and, you know, Aru, it would be very, very surprising to reach the checkout and leave Aru on the shelf. I mean, pr- presumably it's a deal that works out for both sides. They, they probably won't be overpaying. Um because they probably haven't got the budget to do so. So it's kind of a, could be of mutual benefit to both parties because Aru needs, uh, well, if if he hadn't got a place at Quebec at Assos, then it may not have, uh, well, he wouldn't have been in the World Tour next year, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a risky deal, but it's a deal with um, fairly significant upside. If you look at, you know, his pedigree, you go back to his, his um, 2015 season, he was on uh, the podium in two Grand Tours, one uh, Vuelta, second in the Giro. So, um, you know, if he can get back to anything like that level, then obviously it's going to be a master's trade. But even, you know, even last year, um, when people talk about Fabio Aru, um, now it's almost as though he's gone from, you know, boom to complete bust and he can't even um, finish races anymore. That's not quite the case. Um, I mean, last year he was actually going pretty well. Um, on the other side of lockdown so um, ninth at Burgos he did well in the Mont Ventoux one day race but then had his, had a bit of a meltdown at the Tour de France then the UAE well he's not the UAE team manager anymore but he's sort of a consultant Beppe Saron he went on Italian TV and sort of suggested that Aru was mentally weak and was having a bit of a breakdown and people sort of seized upon that and took sides either agreeing with Saron or very much sympathising with um, Aru but my slight worry is um, his temperament in the sense that I think he's quite emotive. We saw that at the tour last year when he pulled out. And um, obviously he wasn't in a great place. Um, you know, well, he hadn't gone well with UAE, with that team over the previous two and a half years. And, um, you know, he the, the camera showed him getting dropped off the back of the bunch. I mean, anyone's going to be upset in that situation. But um, he sort of... I mean, he became quite angry. We'd seen another incident at the Vuelta a couple of years earlier when um, he had problems with his bike. And, you know, it's sort of the problem with riders who are saddled with um, very lofty expectations, having done well early in their career. Um, the, they themselves fight a battle with sort of the, the benchmark that they've set earlier and they get very frustrated. And I guess Ari really needs to overcome that and just find his new sort of dimension, find his level, a level that he's happy at. Um, you know, which might be sort of finishing 10th or 15th in, in major tours, but even that would be very valuable for for his new team because they've, they've signed a lot of solid rulers, a lot of guys who will be able to get into breakaways, who will be able to work for a leader, um, but they need a few sort of pieces to build around. We talked about it last week, didn't we? Potsovivo is one. Um, Simon Clark might be another. Um, Campanarts as well. But uh, Nizzolo, of course. But they, they could do with certainly another GC guy and hopefully Aru will be that for them. Three last bits of news very quickly. Circus Wanty has a new name. Uh, they're stepping up to the World Tour next season after taking over Team CCC's licence and they will be sponsored by a supermarket chain and so will be known as Antia Marche Wanty Gobert. So repeat 50 times. Circus Wanty will be Antia Marche Wanty Gobert. Intermarche is also fine. Intermarche, <laughs> oh, okay. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, the Olympic Games places uh, have been levelled up between men and women uh, for the 2024 Games in Paris. Uh, this has been largely achieved by reducing the size of the men's field from 130 riders to 90 riders. And, uh, well, the, the the goal from the UCI has always been to ensure, first of all, medal parity, so that there would be the same number of medals on offer to men and women, and now competitor parity, so the same number of places. But it does mean reducing the field for the men's road events primarily. Um, and finally, UAE Team Emirates are going to vaccinate all their riders and staff against COVID-19 with the Sinopharm vaccine, uh, which has been developed in China and has had trials done in the UAE. Uh, it's currently still in the, the, the one of the final fa- testing phases, I read, um, but uh, in January, UAE Team Emirates riders and staff will be vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, an interesting one for a sports team to i haven't seen any other sports teams in any sport say that they would uh be vaccinating on quite that basis i think uh, in most places are the vaccines not kind of in the hands of the health authorities rather than um, available for people to buy to vaccinate a sports team i could be wrong on that anyone know i'm not sure i'm not sure um i, I was certainly quite surprised um i, I saw today that they um, have announced that Paolo uh, Tiralongo, who joined the team as a sort of mentor to Fabio Adel um, a few years ago, is leaving. He's no longer going to be a direct sportive. And I must confess, I'm slightly concerned um, by the, the name that they've announced as the his successor. Bill Gates is going to be in the team car next year. <laughs> oh, goodness me. <laughs> wow. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. <laughs> silly, silly season indeed. <laughs> You're listening to The Cycling Podcast, brought to you by iWalker. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk. I-W-O-C-A co.uk. Thank you very much to our title sponsor, Iwaka. We're very grateful to them for their support. And if you run a small business and want to know what Iwaka can do for you, go to iwaka.co.uk. They offer the Sybils Loans, um, Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme, from £50,001 to £750,000, borrow for up to five years, and nothing to pay for 12 months. Um, A Flexi Loan as well, it's a Iwaka product from £1,000 to £200,000. And... The advantage with Iwaka is that you speak to a real person and decisions are made very quickly indeed. Uh, So go to iwaka.co.uk if you'd like to find out more about what Iwaka can do for your small business. Now, uh, Rod Ellingworth and Mark Cavendish, um, both in the news this week with their moves, Cavendish to De Koenig Quick Step, back to De Koenig Quick Step, Rod Ellingworth back to uh, Team Ineos. And I guess... Maybe that one, the, the, the biggest surprise, um, Ellingworth left Team Ineos last year. He left early after handing in his notice um, and relations didn't seem to be very good with Dave Brailsford in particular. Um, he got the opportunity to lead Bahrain McLaren. But there's a bit of uncertainty over that team with McLaren pulling out at the end of the year. And um, Ellingworth has, has jumped ship after a year. Um, I've been trying to call him. I know you guys have too. He's not... Um, He's not wanting to talk about it at the moment, but um, he's 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 back. He's back at Team Ineos, and uh, well, it caught me by surprise. Did it catch you by surprise, Daniel? It, it did to a certain extent, Rich. Um, at the Giro, um, we spoke to Rod and and talked to him about you know what he was planning next year at Bahrain, and I know he's at the Giro, sort of. Um, dealing with some issues as, as as regards staffing for next year, he was taking decisions about you know people who would and wouldn't be in the team um, next year. I think um, he negotiated a contract extension for Peo Bilbao while he was there, and um, so that was at the Giro, and then at the Vuelta. So only a few days later, again I spoke to him a fair bit about. You know, what he was building for next year and how enthusiastic he was, how enthusiastic some of the riders in the team were about 
And what they'd seen is a real sort of change of atmosphere in the team over the last few months. And as, you know, he'd come on board and changes had been made. And, and you know, he was talking about his hope that the team's budget would increase um, over the next year or two and that he'd be able to um, really develop a bit more strength in depth in the team. I think he felt he had good riders there, but didn't have enough really strong riders. So that was about halfway through the Vuelta. No real hint that he was uh, considering his future. And then, um, well, we got to the end of the Vuelta and um, I did notice that he, he went for lunch with Dave Brailsford on the final day of the Vuelta in Madrid, which I was quite surprised about because, as you say, Rich, um, we thought that he hadn't left Ineos on particularly great terms or they, they'd been taken by surprise by him leaving um, 2019. So I didn't, I didn't really know what relations were between Brailsford and, and Rod um, at, at that point. But, yeah, they went for lunch together. Um, I, was an, I was an eyewitness and didn't really think anything more of that. But What did they then, have? Do you well, know what they um, well, they're in, um, they're in a, a little risotto, a little tapas bar, not far from the finish line. So they, they were hiding in plain sight. I mean, if it was supposed to be a secret, you know, um, clandestine meeting of minds, then it wasn't really that because um, you could probably, well, yeah, as I say, they were probably visible from the from the um, Bahrain team bus. And um, yeah, when the news or when the press release was um, came out. A few days ago saying that Rod was going to leave the team immediately I I thought that um, well I started to put two and two together yeah I, I suppose I'm fairly surprised I remember having a conversation with Rod halfway through the tour it was we we're actually in the Place Raymond Poulidor in Chauvigny I just remember that because we both commented on the name of the square that the team buses were parked in and uh, I was asking him how it was going and he was given the impression that you know he was sort of seven eight months into what he felt would be a two-year rebuild to kind of shape the team the way he wanted it both you know on the bike and off the bike and uh, he said he was enjoying it and and hoping uh, as you say hoping that there would be the budget to be able to uh, bring in the riders that he would want to bring in over um, the, the next couple of winters to um, make Bahrain McLaren a, a challenger to the likes of Ineos and Jumbo Visma and uh, I think uh, he was uh, he gave me the impression that he was in, enjoying the fact that he was at the beginning of a particular journey rather than kind of uh, keeping something going which was what it became at uh, Team Sky and Ineos um, you know, just before he left, and now he'll go back. I guess you know what will be the difference in his role when he goes back. What is director of racing? Um, do, you know, how will that differ from race coach, which I think was his previous title? Um, will he go back into the same sort of um, job diff- with the same role and responsibilities, or will he have a, a, a different um, uh, part to play? It's uh, he's never really been, you know, the the guy in the team car calling the shots, a la Nico Portal has he? He's, he's been a sort of um, almost a director of football type role rather than a um, sports well, director more details, kind of role. Yeah, yeah, more on the grounds, ahead of the race, um, really, really detailed in terms of planning and so on. Um, I, I mean, you know, one one thing that occurs to me is that well, a couple of things have changed. McLaren pulling out um, was a big thing. Um, they announced that quite some time ago, but. You know, Ellingworth was employed by McLaren. That was the British company as well. And you got the sense a year ago that McLaren were going to be taking more and more of a role over the next few years and maybe even taking over the team eventually. And at the Tour de France in the first few days, I spoke to Rod and he said that they were waiting for news of a new sponsor to come in. And obviously that that didn't materialise because Bahrain have stepped up again. And I just wonder if that has... um, you know, if there are long-term questions about the, the team's sustainability, um, you know, beyond next year and the year after, um, you know, it's maybe not the project that he thought it was a, a year ago. But also just before, you know, in the year or so before he left Team Ineos, um, he was promoted to performance director, which was Dave Brailsford's old job title. And there was a sense that Ellingworth was being kind of groomed to take over from Brailsford eventually. We didn't manage to speak to Rod Ellingworth, but I did speak to Dave Brailsford last week, and uh, he did say one thing, and obviously I didn't know at the time about Ellingworth going back there, but he did say one thing about his own 
future with the team, which with hindsight might be quite interesting. And it reminded me that what, what am I doing? You know, it's I'd like to be involved in a team. I'd like to have a team that when I stop, which will be, I'm not going to carry on forever, you know, so I'm going to be, I'll be stepping away at some point soon. And um, I'd like to leave a team that I would have loved to have been part of when I, was nine, when I left home at 19. Well, the other aspect to this Rod Ellingworth departure is that it, it raises questions of where this leaves the Bahrain team now, um, because Ellingworth was brought in by uh, the McLaren side of the team to, um, I guess, be a sort of Dave Brailsford type figure, uh, the, the the leader and talisman, um, and and uh, you know create an, an empire, I suppose. You know that was the, that was if you remember, Rich, when we went down to the McLaren HQ roughly this time last year that was what they were talking about wasn't it it was about building a team over the the medium and longer term and uh, well within a year um Bahrain are gonna have to change what they do and I, I think we all noticed Brent Copeland who had been at Bahrain before Rod Ellingworth um went in there uh tweeting something along the lines of you know that wasn't how it was supposed to work out. Uh, Copeland is now at the Mitchelton team, of course. Um, and I suppose the other big question about Bahrain is Milan Erzen, who again has denied any involvement or link to the Adalas blood doping ring, which centres on Slovenia. And um, this has come out again um, as part of a German investigation into doping centering on uh, Slovenia blood doping primarily and um, so there's lots of different uh, aspects to this that we'll presumably learn a bit more about over the coming month but um, certainly Bahrain the team is uh, well it's going to have to have a, a Rod Ellingworth replacement it, need, it will need somebody to uh, lead and run the team we don't really know who that will be at the moment. The, the final footnote I'd add to that, uh, Lionel, is that there will be a few individuals there at Bahrain um, who will be will have been taken by surprise, I think, by this and, and won't be thrilled or won't have been thrilled to hear the news. There's obviously quite a, a distinct British flavour to that team that's come, um, I guess, well, with Rod as a result of uh, Rod being recruited a couple of years ago. So there are a few riders, a few young British riders, Fred Wright, Stephen Williams, uh, Scott Davis. I know, for example, that Rod fought quite hard um, for Stephen Williams to have his contract renewed. He's had a lot of injury problems the last couple of years, but has, has been given a new deal. And there are also members of the staff, aren't there? Rod, uh, Roger Hammond, one of the direct sportives, Tim Harris as well. They've been, they were sort of brought on board with with Rod. And there are other riders, I think, who um, were were just very enthusiastic about working with Rod. The prospect of working with Rod. I spoke to Marco Haller, the Austrian rider, um, about a year ago when he signed for Bahrain. He said that, that Rod was one of the main reasons why he wanted to be a part of of that team. Well, the other big story um mark Cavendish, ellingworth's former protege um and you know it's funny there was an interview with patrick lefebvre on on cycling news very revealing uh an interesting interview um where he gives a bit more detail about how this this move came about um but it, it happened just a, a day or so after the pana which was the final classic of the year i was there and i spoke to eve lampert about the prospect of Cavendish joining um, De Kooning quick So he was very enthusiastic, you know, a big, a big fan, a big admirer of Cavendish. And I spoke to Cavendish as well at the end of the, the race. He'd fallen off. He'd been in the front echelon and crashed. And he said he was very tight-lipped, as they say, about his future, but made it pretty clear that he wanted to stay in the sport. I spoke to Tristan Hoffman as well, who his director at um, Bahrain McLaren, who said how keen he was to stay in the sport. And it was, well, we know now from the Patrick Lefebvre interview that the meeting with Lefebvre happened a day or so later. And um, it seemed to be conditional on Cavendish bringing in a sponsor. And and this is this is an interesting uh, dimension to the story. We had an agent last week, of course, Gary McQuaid, talking about um, this being a thing of the, the past, that, that riders, you know, are no longer expected to bring sponsors in. Cavendish is maybe a slightly a different case, but... Um, it was a, a, a claim that, that really jumped out of the piece at me. I don't know what you guys thought. Well, yes, Rich, and I suppose we need further clarification. I've been um, trying to get a hold of Mark's agent today just to, to get some clarification on that um, because it, it's a little bit of a grey area. I mean, 
Um, nominally, all sponsors are getting involved with professional cycling teams to be associated with certain athletes, whether it's a whole group of athletes, um, which is you know usually the case, or in some cases, without declaring it, that might be the main motivation for certain sponsors to um, align themselves with a with a team. Um, in this case, we don't know whether it's um, a private individual that Patrick Lefebvre is talking about, whether it's um, an existing sponsor. I mean, for example, you know, I know that, that Mark had an, uh, an association with and a sort of a, a friendship, a relationship with specialized bikes that went beyond um, his time with the, the previous incarnation of this team. So, um, you know, he remained very good friends, I think, with Mike Sinyard, who is the, the founder of Specialized. And, and, you know, it may be that Specialized have just um, decided to pony up a bit more cash um, in order to have Mark in the team. So we need a bit more clarification. But, um, you know, a lot of people have pointed out that this is a practice that's previously been sort of condemned and um, and even punished. Um, in 2017, there was an investigation in Italy, and this was led by the Italian Cycling Federation, and it resulted in um, our good friend Gianni Savio um, being sentenced to th- well, a three-month ban on, on appeal um, because, essentially, there was a rider who, who joined his team, Androni um, Giocattoli, and um, it was determined that he, he he was a rider who wouldn't have got a spot on the team, but he had agreed to bring on board two sponsors. I can't remember exactly which sponsors they were. And the same also happened. Androni and Giacato. <laughs> yes. Um, and the same... Oh, come on, Daniel. Also... There's only 22 of them to narrow it down. <laughs> Yeah, I hope it wasn't Guava Berry Golf. That would um, <laughs> that would shatter my um, some of my romantic and visions of how that deal came about but um uh, and angelo Chitrak of the well now the team is called vini zabu um, he was also given a three month um sentence i mean they, they were effectively banned from races for three months for for something very similar um and indeed actually there was a third team so third um, pro conti team at the time um, what is now Bardiani, their manager as well, Bruno Reverberi, was also sentenced. But that was a, a, an Italian Cycling Federation um, court that made those decisions in that instance, although at the time they did say that they were going to pass the documentation, pass the information on to the UCI, um, but there was no further action taken against the, the three teams I mentioned there. I guess there, there are two a- aspects to, to this. I mean... Th- I, you know, I, d- I don't know if, if Lefebvre um, has, you know, not he's not really done Cavendish a favour there because th- the suggestion is that Cavendish is there because he was able to bring in extra money rather than because of his, his abilities as a rider. Um, I'm not sure that that really matters to a rider of Cavendish's kind of stature. But um, looking beyond that, at the, at the, at the kind of... Um, the, the the narrative arc of Cavendish's career, um, he has had three or four pretty awful seasons of steady decline. And you know when I think of him standing in that car park in Depana, you know miserable day, blowing a hoolie, um, chucking it down with rain, and he was feeling sorry for himself having crashed. That would not have been a fitting way for him to end his career. And at least going back to the kind of quick set for one last hurrah, you know even if he doesn't contest uh, another sprint finish, even if he's just part of the team it does give him the opportunity to to go out um in a in a more appropriate way than in a car park in depana in Nove- early november yeah i think there's um i was going to say you know, famously somebody didn't they want to say there's no no gifts in professional cycling um that was lance armstrong after he gifted marco pantani a win on mon von two of course in the tour de france but uh you know it was originally bernardino though wasn't it, it pr- what pas de cadeau did, did he not tell armstrong that pr- that in fact that, that does ring a bell yeah um but uh you know, whether or not, you know, Mark Cavendish is one of the greatest riders of all time. Um, you know, in terms of the Tour de France stages, he's won. World Championship, he's won. Milan San Remo, he's won. And um, whilst there's no room in a sort of cutthroat professional sport, um, there's no room for sentimentality. I'd agree that, uh, you know, he, Cavendish does deserve a, a, a more fitting send-off than um, a 
coronavirus interrupted season um you know no kind of last hurrah in you know the tour de france there still may not be of course in the tour de france but uh, the opportunity to race for one more season and um you know perhaps he can hit a hit a patch of form and get get himself over the finish line ahead of everybody else somewhere whether it's a a, a big win or a small win um, you know, I think there's, 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 what there's this... more. Uh, there is a more fitting uh, denouement to Cavendish's season than, as you say, Rich, just kind of climbing off his bike at the end of uh, uh, three days of Depana in miserable conditions. I think what this also gives him the opportunity to do is to be part of a winning team. You know, I think it might no longer be about him. Um, I think we've seen in the past Cavendish has been very willing to to be a teammate and to do his bit for the team. And if he can be part of that winning machine and, and involved in wins. I've seen some quotes from um, um, Wilfred Peters today saying that in a lot of the, the, the races um, in the early season, they want him to be basically finish at 5Ks to go, you know, do his job for the team and then, and then you know, be contribute what he can rather than be the guy that they're working for. I, I think that's probably a more likely scenario, especially in a team like that. But I think, I think he will derive a lot of satisfaction from that. If he can be involved in, in, in wins, um, I think... Again, that would also be a kind of more fitting way for him to exit. Yeah, I think the other thing we should point out is that the key difference, the key distinction between this instance, even if it was, if it did come to light that um, you know a sponsor had agreed to to pony up some some extra money um, to sort of guarantee his salary, and the key difference between this and those other cases I mentioned earlier of the Italian teams is that those riders. Um, in those instances were were effectively only bringing the sponsor and it was sort of determined, decided that, that there was no other sort of meritocratic reason for them to be on those particular teams. Whereas in this case, what Decoin and Quick Step are paying for is a a body of work um, which, which guarantees um, a, a certain amount of well, of publicity and prestige, and they're you know they're associating themselves with 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 that as well as what Cavendish can bring um, on top as a as a rider. As far as how much he can contribute is concerned, I mean the the great mystery really is is how good an athlete he is now, and this is what we don't we don't really or we can't really say with any confidence we don't really know i remember speaking to rod ellingworth in the summer actually um at the at the dauphine so just after lockdown about you know whether mark might still make it to the tour um into the tour team for bahrain or how he was actually going and rod said that the the lockdown had been sort of fatal for his chances of, of riding the tour and he'd actually been going pretty well last in the spring last year he'd um he'd worked quite well with phil bauhaus the um, German sprinter, uh, a couple of early season races, um, but the the lockdown had really um, it really killed his momentum. And I think you know, Rich, you've mentioned this um, uh, as well that uh, quite a lot of the teams in their sort of final analysis of the very unusual 2020 season said that it was the the older riders that suffered, and they suffered in particular with things like weight control. And a lot of them came out of the other end. I mean, we saw it with guys like Valverde; they weren't quite themselves and um, whereas you know we all talked about this great wave of new young talent and um, you know that is no doubt a real thing that is no doubt happening but it might also be due to the very unusual season that we had in 2020 so you know judging the second half of Cavendish's season um, is quite difficult and you probably have to layer in a few caveats but you know we don't you know we haven't seen we haven't analyzed the power files um, you know we don't know whether realistically he can still measure up to the guys who will be contesting sprints in 2020, um, sorry, in 2021. Um, the very worst case scenario is that this can be a, a, a dignified, um, worthy victory tour, victory lap at the end of, as we say, a, a fantastic career. Shoot, uh, shoot at the du peloton, cycling podcast team car, the back of the pack, please. That said, PK, to remind us to tell you that this week's episode is sponsored by LACA. LACA is a community of cyclists working together to ensure bikes and equipment in the event of damage or loss. By forming a collective, they ensure that the premiums are lower and the payouts in the event of a claim are swifter. 
Because Laka are well known to us and have a lot of our listeners as customers, they have formed a community of cycling podcast listeners within their wider community. Visit laka.co and use the code TCP when you sign up to join our community within Laka. By doing so, you will be supporting the cycling podcast. I'm a Laka customer, but thankfully I haven't had to make a claim yet. Let's hear from somebody who has. Hi, my name's Leslie. I've been a Laka customer since summer of last year. So went out for a bike ride with my mate Tom. We'd signed up to a ultra endurance race and we decided to start our training a little bit early in the October. And um, about 10k into the ride, uh, I took a bit of a, a hard um, crash on the on the pavement and the front end of the bike took the, the main brunt of it. I ruptured my EPL, which basically means that you can't hitchhike and the, the thumb doesn't move, doesn't really do anything. They've got a live chat on their, on their app and on their website where you can um, immediately talk to someone and ask them a question. One of the, um, the members of staff there immediately you know, responded to me. They were the ones that had actually said, oh, it looks like you've got a crack on your bike. If I were dealing with another insurance company, they probably, you know, they wouldn't even have picked that up. They are riders. They know what they're talking about. You know, they come from a cycling history. And literally within 24 hours, the amount of money that I had claimed for... It was, yeah, 24 hours and the money um, was transferred into my account. Well, the big news for Laka is that they are launching soon in the Netherlands. So if any Dutch listeners would like to know more, go to laka.co forward slash NL. As I said earlier, new customers can get £10 off when they sign up with Laka. Go to laka.co, that's L-A-K-A dot C-O, and use the code TCP to join the Cycling Podcast community. Well, last week, uh, at the end of last week, we had what we thought was the Team Sunweb launch presentation for 2021. And I think everybody was surprised to discover that it was actually a rebranding, a new sponsor, DSM, um, huge company from the Netherlands, as you mentioned earlier, Lionel, taking over from Sunweb, a holiday company. And I guess, you know, the the holiday industry is not um, faring well under coronavirus so in that sense not a surprise but Sunweb were a long term uh, sponsor with a kind of a rolling agreement um, and so really DSM appear to have come in to, to save the team uh, reading between the lines um, and I guess the great achievement of the team has been to, um, to, to manage that transition without anybody really uh, knowing that there was uncertainty over the team. And the man who deserves credit for that is Ivan Speckenbrink, the the boss um, at that team. He's been in charge since the start, hasn't he? So all the way back to the Skill Shimano days, I think, when they were a pro-continental team beginning to um, emerge and become a World Tour team. I spoke to Speckenbrink about this new sponsor and also their veteran rider, Nicholas Roach, um, about being part of this team, he's been big teams before, obviously BMC and Team Sky, um, and how how Sunweb now DSM matches up. Let's hear first from Spec and Brink, and then from Roach. I mean, this is this is an absolute major major company, and one of the biggest companies uh, out there. I'm not sure if you've seen the show. Um, it's huge, so uh, this is not something that you do uh, overnight. They have procedures in place, they have stakeholders, they have a board, they have executive board, they have supervisory board. I mean, this is, yeah, with these kind of companies and also uh, with this kind of deals, it's not something that you do uh, uh, overnight. And of course, we're already working a long time with this company and, and it was definitely a dream of also of me personally, that one day we could uh, we could do this with this company, because its relevance for the team it's bringing new and it's bringing innovations to a complete new level into the sport, but also being relevant uh, in terms of social responsibility. I mean, what they do is also a lot outside uh, the world of sports, in which we contribute their efforts. Yeah, that's obviously a dream. It's so big, um, so you don't do it overnight, um, and it just became yeah, like I said in the presentation. So much changes here with COVID uh, that that what was a dream, yeah, became now uh, something like well, let's now really go for this dream and let's make it happen. Um, uh, yeah, there were more scenarios on the table. Obviously, we 
Sunna was very happy with us and we, we can only be grateful for, for how they have supported us and also not only being a partner of the team but being a true partner that we could uh, the way how we believe that you can best perform in, in, within, within our frame of values uh, how to get the best out of ourselves they just supported this um, so we are gr grateful to them and then of course if COVID strikes and you have all these restrictions measures etc yeah, it was one option to continue like that. But for them, marketing is a little bit less relevant if you cannot sell so much. Um, so, yeah, uh, obviously they support the team. But when there was a unique opportunity and and, and when that moment came, yeah, yeah, we went back to Sunweb, obviously, and say we, we, we can make our dream come true. And, yeah, that was done all in good, in good harmony. Uh, I mean... You, the the season that you've had can't have done any harm in, in selling uh, the team to uh, DSM. I mean, was that did that help to clinch it? It was uh, you know we noticed you didn't seem to be around all that much at the Tour de France, and and maybe that that becomes clearer now. Uh, were you sort of in meetings? Were you trying to to, to tie this up? Um, and you know how helpful was the performance at the Tour in terms of just sealing the deal? There is, there is. I mean, we are in, in a sports world, and 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 one of the things you're measured of is performance. So, yeah, if they say you are a nice team, nice people, but the performance is poor, does obviously not help. I mean, that's an important factor. But this story, obviously, we, yeah, that, that we spoke with, uh, that we exchanged ideas with DSM, that we build on concepts, and then you have the legal issue, you have the stakeholders issue. So obviously, we were already far advanced. Uh, um, but it's always nice that people get a confirmation of what we, of what we do. So it's never bad, even though the process was already on its way, of course. Did the writers um, have any inkling that this work was going on behind the scenes to, to secure the team's future? No, no. We just, like I said, we just, uh, it was, for me personally, it was a bit uh, almost schizophrenic at some times. We, I definitely wanted to, I saw this year as an opportunity uh, we, we, we are not the people who say, ah, the world is different, you have to keep one and a half meter distance, when will there be races, which races? People, you can panic, and we, we always believe in opportunity. It means also, hey, we can make quicker improvements than others. So we focus day and night on, on making riders better, making actually improving the people in our organization, making coaches literally better, uh, experts better, create more knowledge. And that paid off. And at the same time, uh, it was sometimes in the nights. The other part, uh, yeah, it was like, uh, like, like, yeah, putting this in place. So it was very intense. But no, we, we kept the calm and we kept just focusing on not we need our results, but on getting better. And then you get quicker results. First of all, uh, big big kudos to uh, to Sunweb for holding uh, strong till the end of the year. And you know, we're one of the teams that did not suffer from any uh, staff um, or, or rider being fired or staff restrictions or, or salary cuts or whatever. So so big, big, big thank you for them for, for, for supporting us all the way through this year. And, and obviously a, a massive thank you to, to DSM for, for taking over for the next few years. Uh, just as you mentioned, it's been quite a, a financial hit for, for almost every, every business in, on the planet this year. Um, and it's very difficult to find someone with you know that kind of budget to, to come in into a cycling business. So so it, it's you know it's quite uh, quite remarkable. And when you look at the resources that they can actually bring to the team, it, it's pretty exciting and pretty amazing. I think it's probably a first to have uh, a, a title sponsor that can actually bring multiple um, uh, assets to the to the team in terms of technology in terms of diet provide their own uh supplements uh, but also the technology into cycling wear as well with the dyneema um project so i think it's quite a, it's quite it's quite quite interesting and i'm really looking forward to working uh, even closer with them i was going to ask you as well nicholas how how are you enjoying being part of this team you've been on big teams before um sunweb though you know there seemed to be something special about that that team this year in particular, and at the Tour de France especially, um, the way that you rode it as a team, uh, and uh, you know had had often multiple options on on stages, um, and and got some rewards, some great rewards as well. How how are you enjoying being part of the team, and how did you enjoy in particular the Tour de France? 
I, I really enjoy being part of the team. It's, um, you know, the, the first couple of months was, you know, like I said, like you said, it's a team that is very, very different in how they, they work. And it took me some time to, to adapt. Uh, but now that I've, that I've completely, completely adapted, I think last year was, was, I was really settled in and felt that, um, I was in the right team and my, my role was quite well established in, in, in terms of what I, what was expected from me and what I could deliver on the bike for, for the team. And then coming into the tour, uh, well, you know, my, my, my role on the bike was to, to really, really support um the guys uh, guide them uh, put them into the best position for them to deliver uh, and 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 wow they did they delivered and you know we were quite similar type of riders we didn't have you know uh, um someone that could win the mountain top finish for example we focused on some stages uh the, the plan was very very clear uh, management had had days where where we were completely off that the goal was like all right today is Everyone's in the Gruppetto. We lose as much time as we want. Um, and, and tomorrow it's on the attack again. And every day there was a clear plan. Um, and, and, you know, uh, the, the thing with these teams is they work on protocols. And um, when protocols, when you get second, third, fifth and seventh, uh, you're told that your protocols are not good. But when you keep that protocol and then eventually you start getting wins, then suddenly you're coming from the wrong pro- – well, someone who thinks you're using wrong protocols or racing wrong to being a mastermind or a genius. Mm. So the, the borderline is very, very subtle there. And, you know, at the end of the day, what was, um, what was really, really remarkable in the tour was not only the tactic, but the fact that it was all about trying to win. But not to win as an individual, but trying to win um, for the team. And, and and we saw it. There was days we had ten guys up the front, and there was three of us. And and it was all about not about saving the legs and seeing. All right, can I get third? Maybe try and win the stage of the Tour de France. And we're talking the Tour stage of the Tour de France. I've done ten of them, dreaming of a of a stage win. And, and this year round, I was sacrificing myself for for the young lads because I knew they could get it where I've tried it already and I'm, I've been always close enough and as and then getting it that was you know for me it was obviously it's incomparable I did not win it to say to the France but I had some kind of satisfaction in saying all right I'm doing my job right and these guys are delivering you're uh, obviously with the team next year I, I, I want to use the word experience you're very experienced now <laughs> um do you think about you know your role has obviously changed but do you think about how much longer you want to be a professional for i'm not ready to stop <laughs> hmm. i'm not ready to stop i i i love my work too much i have too much passion um i still feel i can bring something to the sport i don't feel useless uh you know some some riders it could be in terms of results uh, I know in terms of results, I can I can still get results, but I know I'm useful for this new generation of riders, and I can really bring something to them. I'm still a strong personality in the world of cycling, and and I just love my job. I'm not ready to to stop. How long? Uh, unfortunately, I think I will not be the one that will decide it. But uh, hopefully, at least another so 21 plus two. That would be. Uh, I would love to to go until 23. Well, Speck and Brink, uh, they are chaps um you know not not giving too much away about the conversations he's been having the meetings um he's been involved in this year um and i thought it was very interesting roach saying that the team uh the riders were sort of oblivious if there was uh uncertainty they never had any salary cuts or um you know there wasn't talk of the team not surviving um and the environment they seem to have created one where you know the emphasis the priority the focus was on performance obviously uh worked well for them because they had a terrific season from you know tour de france to the the giro two men in the podium at the giro and uh i guess you know great credit to speckenbrink for um for for managing this this process apparently seamlessly well i think rich it is certainly very praiseworthy what they've managed to do there and the the origins of well this new sponsorship deal um, are to be found if you go back a couple of years and look at the last time that Sunweb um, renewed their contract or the, 
it was the last time there was an announcement about the team's sponsorship. Um, in so 2018, there was a new deal with Sunweb announced, and what was reported then was that the the company would sponsor the team at least until the end of 2019, and when the existing contract expired, a new one with no set date would be activated. Um, and also that even if the team and some web decided to terminate the deal at any point, the sponsorship would still run for another two years, plus the remainder of the year in which the release cause was triggered. So... Um, we don't know exactly when Sunweb communicated to Spec and Brink that they were going to pull out, but um, the team was never in any immediate danger. And, and I guess this also explains why the Sunweb logo will still appear um, on the, the jersey next year, because they will still be um, funding the team to, to some extent. Well, as we've said a lot over the racing season since the lockdown eased and, and racing returned you know Sunweb really had performed um, better than expected really I mean uh, certainly the Tour de France so they um, when you looked at the the roster at the start of the tour and the kind of the absence of a GC rider there you wondered a little bit what are they going to do in the race of course we knew Mark Hershey was a talent but we didn't quite anticipate him uh you know getting off the front with adam yates and julian alaphilippe over the hills in nice and and being one of the men of the day right at the start of the of the tour and then getting his well he came very close and then he finally got his stage win and and of course hershey has been one of the stories of the season with his performances elsewhere um you know really interesting to see how he uh continues that on next season i mean you know the the performance in in flesh alone and uh, the world championships and so on uh, you know real a-list stuff um but what will be interesting for me is to see how roman bardet settles into that team um you know they've lost wilco kelderman they've still got jai hindley another big breakthrough performance at the giro of course finishing on the podium uh, nearly winning the thing um, but Roman Bardet an established rider with some kind of frailties vulnerability to his game I guess um, going from a position where you know he was the outstanding team leader of AG2R you know, everything was kind of for him at the Tour de France for a number of years and and perhaps uh, well if you remember Francois Tomaso making the point this time last year that uh, Bardet needed to perhaps broaden horizons and target something different and the plan had been for him to ride the Giro d'Italia this season if the season had gone ahead as normal um, but it'll be interesting to see how he slots into this team which has kind of made a speciality of being competitive across the board hasn't it it's not really got a one focal point and I wonder whether that will change with the emergence of Hershey particularly for you know well he, he did say in uh, um, the the press thing that he did this week which I, I did record rich but the quality is not hmm. uh, not uh, great to to play back but he did say that for the time being he you know he's not going to be trans transitioning to a sort of grand tour type rider he's going to focus on one day races and uh, stage wins and that kind of thing uh, he's not really in a hurry to uh, doesn't really need to hurry to do anything he's still only 22 um, but it will be interesting to see you know how he responds now that everyone knows who he is and what he's capable of um, but yeah certainly a team to watch and I think Rich you've made the case that uh, pound for pound probably the team of the year The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport Science in Sport fueled by Science a question for James Morton at Science Support from James Lilly. I've been reading about the benefits of beetroot in regards to exercise. Does James have any thoughts regarding this and or um, do any of their products, Science Support's products, emulate this, contain beetroot? That's from James Lilly. Yes, thanks for your question, James. You're absolutely right. In the last 10 to 15 years, there's been an explosion of research all investigating the effects of nitrate on performance. And the reason why it's referred to as beetroot is because beetroot actually contains nitrate. So a lot of the studies have used beetroot juice as the, the su substance to deliver the nitrate. And effectively what we see in all of those studies, it improves what's called our efficiency. And what that means is that we actually require less oxygen to perform at the same workload. 
and then as a result the exercise is easier and power output can improve and we go faster for longer and so on and this has been observed in not just cycling also in running type studies also in team sport type exercise as well but from a practical point of view the big problem is a lot of athletes just don't like the taste of beetroot um and actually, we've been working hard at science and sport in the last few years to try and overcome this. And in just a few months ago, we launched the nitrate range, which isn't based on using beetroot as the nitrate source. Rather, we've used rhubarb and spinach extract. And so we've got a whole host of products in this space, which are nitrate rich, um, but use different sources of nitrate. And the taste profile is completely different. So if you haven't tried that and you are interested in nitrate as a, an ergogenic aid, if you like, then I would definitely recommend that you try these products and hopefully they do make a difference to you. Well, that was James Morton, the Director of Performance Solutions at Science and Sport, also Professor of Exercise Metabolism and Nutrition at Liverpool John Moores University. And, uh, well, he has been answering your questions thanks to our a sponsorship with science and sport they have supported us since 2016 if you have a question for james please email us contact at the cycling podcast.com any nutrition questions at all about your own sports nutrition or the pros nutrition email us contact at the cycling podcast.com um, and if you want 25 percent off all your science and sport products go to science and sport.com um, and enter the code SISCP25. How do I fuel for a 12-hour relay on the turbo, Richard? That's the big question. We've got one coming uh, up. Well, you'll, we? have to ask, you'll have to email contact <laughs> at thecyclingpodcast.com and we'll put your question, Lionel, to James Morton. Excellent. How about that? Thank you. Can't say fairer than that. Right. Um, yeah, we do have, we do have a, a 12-hour event um, coming up, Cranked Up, we're going to take part in, aren't we, as a, as a relay. Look up Cranked Up. You'll find it on the the internet um, raising money for some some good causes um now lionel we should mention at this point as well before we hear um sherry pridham um, and and about her move to israel startup nation um friends of the podcast people have been signing up again as a friend of the podcast um our our new system launched just over a year ago so uh, people are signing up once again for 2021 there's a new friend special coming up this week it's part one of a two-parter at which you mentioned you teased earlier part two will follow a week or so later it's been really good fun to work on this one um but thanks everyone who has signed up as a friend of the podcast um it, you can do so at the cycling podcast.com for 15 pounds that will gain you access to all of the friends specials that we release um, and we've got more coming over christmas as well and for 50 pounds you will get uh, an exclusive gift uh, your choice of either a cycling podcast casket or a brand new and very beautiful tea towel if you sign up as a friend for 100 pounds well first of all thank you very much for your support it's essential to us and we are very appreciative um, and you'll get both gifts you'll get the tea towel and the casket and it's a very you've just taken delivery of the caskets line i have what do they look like oh they're fantastic they're very why aren't you wearing one uh, um good question well the reason i'm not wearing one is uh the, the the big box of caps has arrived it's on my dining table and uh my daughter has got one and now she calls that my hat my hat well, I'm, I can't, I'm glad, I can't I'm glad get that's it. the reason i, I thought you were going to say it's because they're all extra small <laughs> or something <laughs> no they're not they're lovely they're, they've been made by miltag for us and uh well, you can see a design if you sign up to our newsletter. Um, go can to thecyclingpodcast.com. I can, yes. It's got a, a, a sort of dusky pink peak with the Cycling Podcast logo on it. Um, it's got a pale blue and white kind of uh, jigs almost jigsaw design on the sides with the, with, with the sound wave motif, which also features on our Katusha jersey, and a, a very attractive dark blue strip down the center so traditional cycling cap style very nice material and it says friend of the cycling podcast on the side um and yeah we'll be posting these out in the new year once the tea towels have arrived as well um are you gonna post one to us maybe um at some point i, I will do yeah can i get one yeah. do i have to sign up as a friend <laughs> to get one no I, you can have one i guess yeah you Thanks. can have one daniel's a You've big got my fan, address, I believe. a big fan of the casket so i'll get one out to daniel i'll just put daniel freeb 
international man of mystery and it will find you somehow i wherever you are daniel it will reach you but just on the friends of the podcast system if you signed up last year um there is an auto renew option which is uh default so if you haven't disabled that uh, you you don't need to do anything your subscription will just continue seamlessly and yeah thank you very much for your support because um it does enable us to plan 2021 and our coverage of the the three grand tours um i've also got a, a quite an exciting explore project that i'm mm. in the, that i'm planning at the moment that uh, has really uh, captured my imagination looking forward to hopefully doing that in early june more uh, on that at some point in the future and uh keep your feedback coming as well we always enjoy getting your feedback um really enjoyed this tweet from bob oliver uh probably in re- response to last week's episode probably the most boring podcast ever this one went on far too long interviews interminable was your editor on holiday <laughs> not your finest guys end of season lethargy me thinks probably a good idea on paper but execution poor uh, we're kind of flattered that that you think we commit these ideas to paper um but uh yeah appreciate that thank you bob for that um well we should probably get on with the next interminable interview no um sherry pridham i mean she's been in the news in the last week uh she has been appointed sports director for Israel's startup nation world tour team of course and really stepping up next year with chris Froome joining Sepp van Mark joining Mike Woods and others. Uh, so a huge opportunity for her and um, a very newsworthy story because she is the first uh, female sports director in the world tour. We, sp- we featured Robin Morton, who was a DS at the 1984 Giro, as you said, Lionel, in our Giro and also in a previous episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina. But I spoke to Sherry Pridham this week just to find out how this move had come about. It goes back to sort of April time just before we went, well, while we were in lockdown. And as you do, you know, I sort of started looking at how it could improve, which was Vetus Pro Cycling at the time. And we knew we were going to be, uh, we were headhunting sponsors anyway to continue. Um, And then long story short, we we had quite a warm lead which fell through because of COVID and the kind of uncertainty of, of, return on investment for, for, for this particular sponsor um, and, and the uncertainty of the race program and delivery and here, here with the domestic scene. So um, I thought, OK, you know, we can we can drag this through, we can take it through. And then you know, I don't know, it was sort of September time. I thought, right, um, we can't there's no way I can risk registering the team UCI. I'm going to take the team through at elite level. And then as it happened, we lost another small sponsor for similar reasons and then I started questioning my own kind of um, ability to survive as a, you know as just just general paying the bills and, and looking after myself so to speak um, because it was quite clear that I'd have to start looking for a, a proper job um, to support my income and also try and take a team through at elite level and that wasn't it just wasn't looking great at all i think i applied for 30 40 jobs in the real world and i uh i think um i had three responses um and and i thought well why not why not put my name out there with some will tour teams so i did you know i reached out to a handful um and i had a response almost straight away from um israel startup nation initially with a phone call um was very excited about the fact that Chell Colstrom took time out of his busy schedule to uh, to even pick the phone up and chat to me and listen to my aims and my ambitions and you know what I wanted to achieve as a person but what potentially I could bring to to his team um, and then of course they they were so busy with the Walter and or the Giro and then the Walter never really heard anything but in the meantime you know things were sort of going the wrong in the wrong direction for for my own team um we had a board meeting long story short i came away from that board meeting knowing that i needed to make the decision and it wasn't a good one and that was to close the team but you know on my terms i i was very determined not to fail if i'd taken the team through at uh elite level and then maybe lost another sponsor in april or you know, and and I just thought, you know, while I can, 
I don't suppose finishing at the top sounds sounds the right right sort of phrase, but I wanted it under my terms. And um, we made the decision at, at board level. I came back and spoke to spoke to my family, um, and then within within an hour, I had a contract offer of closing one team down, and, and the two just wouldn't have been. You know, I, I just couldn't have imagined having a contract offer literally an hour sure. after I closed one one team down. I am wow. it, it, it just yeah, incredibly yeah. An, an emotional day for sure. I mean, you, you know, you, you touch on your job in the last several years has been you know not just being a DS but running a team and you know managing a business. I suppose um, yeah, it must be nice to have a, a job now and look forward to a job where you will just be able to focus on the on the sporting side I guess oh 100% I'm so so excited I mean I, you know I had a little bit of a taste of when I was employed by rally and you know we had you know a very a very very decent budget in those days um and then I was employed and I was I was able to do what um you know what I'm sort of good at but um just, just the enormity and the size of this team has made me realise just how big this opportunity is, um, and the the fact that there are that many people that are there to help not just me as a DS but all the DSs on ISN uh, make our job, you know, that much more easier because we've got performance coaches and coaches and everything else that work towards one goal, if you like. And if you look at the riders you'll be working with, um, you know, obviously Chris Froome, but yeah, Mike Woods, Seth Van Mark, uh, Dan Martin, um, mm. you know, some of the, the best riders in the world. How much do you relish that prospect? I can't wait. Um, I, um, Of course I'm going to have a little bit of, you know, sort of apprehension and, and so on. But I, you know... I just generally treat everybody, you know, I think what people don't really realize with me is what you see with me is what you get. Um, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty relaxed. I'm fairly calm in, in majority of decisions I make. And, you know, I, I think I've had that success and managing, managing people and riders different, you know, different sort of personalities is, is one of my skills. And, um, yeah, a bike rider is a bike rider at the end of the day. There's been a lot of focus, obviously, on the fact you're the first female sports director in a in a world tour, in a men's world tour team, I should say. Um, mm -hmm. How I mean, is that important to you? Do you um, is that is that something that makes you feel particularly proud, or or is it is it kind of irrelevant? Um, I've seen some comments from you saying that you know your your job is is just sports director, not female sports director. Well, first and foremost, yeah, that that's how I've seen myself right back in as far as the early days when I took over Rally, and you know I was the first female to 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 head a UCI Conti British Conti team, um, and, and it's exactly the same here. But I've never I've never seen myself as as oh I'm you, you know I'm I'm different to everybody else. I've I've just been one of the boys, if if you like, um, and I don't. I want that to continue. Really, I know from from the significance of all the you know the press interest and everything. I, I might need to change and look because I had so many messages of with, with women, particularly coming to me saying thank you for for showing us the way. You know, you've given us so much confidence and real, real lovely uh, messages. And I think um, you know I might need to look at that um, and pay a little bit more mm. attention to the, you know to that role. Um, um, that I've sort of yeah. acquired, I guess. In the last yeah, three. maybe in in the reactions of some others, you can you can maybe get get a, get a truer sense of 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 a kind of wider significance to it. Yeah, yeah, I think um, yeah, it, it needs to sink in as well. You know, um, it, it it clearly is bigger than I ever imagined. Well, it does feel like a significant move, doesn't it? But perhaps it shouldn't really, because I think, you know, I was thinking about this in light of the announcement and was pondering, you know, when Mariana Voss retires or Lizzie Deignan retires or Anna van der Bregen retires, are we really to think that they wouldn't be uh, capable and experienced enough um, to do the job of sports director for a men's team? I think that anyone who's... 
um, raced at the highest level and at, certainly anyone who's done the, the job in um, the Women's World Tour would be you know, the sort of person that uh, could apply for and be given a job in the Men's World Tour and Sherry Pridham has been doing this job in men's cycling numerous tours to Yorkshire and uh, tours of Britain which are okay not world tour events but um, you're dealing with all of the same challenges and difficulties and tactical decisions that need to be made as as she will face in the world tour and uh, I did see a comment on our Facebook discussion group Rich somebody made the point that and I don't know whether this stacks up but it's something that w- was really interesting to me um, that in rowing often the the cox is uh, or you know not often but uh, the cox can be a woman as well as a man and you know no one bats an eyelid and i, I wonder whether there's some similarity between the the type of role uh, in the team car that is is the sports director a bit like the cox in rowing and so i don't think there should be i guess in rowing physical size is a fact there isn't it because you're you're carrying them they're not they're not carrying their sports directors on their bikes yet um, in a little <laughs> that's, side car, that, that would be that is true. <laughs> so, so you mean they're chosen? Uh, the 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 fact that they're lighter weight means that yeah, the Coxes an are always very small, yeah. aren't they? Little little Colin Moynihan, remember him, the old sports minister. He was a Cox, wasn't he? Yeah. Okay. But then you know when that becomes important, then suddenly. There's, you know, there's no barrier to having a, a woman who is the same weight well, as a exactly. light it's man. Well, it's obviously not so, the only thing. No, exactly. It's obviously not the only thing. Yeah, but yeah. It, no, that just interested me, and it just made me think um, that uh, I think that the the first appointee is, you know, could open the door and um, allow others. You know, once once somebody has appointed a woman to do that job, um, it, in a way, you know, while it shouldn't make it easier, I think it probably will make it easier for other teams to, to follow suit and as I say as uh, um, you know as the Women's World Tour also uh, matures and expands and grows in, in, in terms of you know how many events there are and the types of races there are and so on more people from the Women's World Tour uh, may well be able to cross over into the Men's World Tour and vice versa. I think uh, you raised an interesting point, Lionel, there about how applicable, well, you know, different skill sets are. If someone's had a, a history in British racing as opposed to the Women's World Tour, as opposed to the Men's World Tour, I mean, it could, w- one point of view is that it might be an advantage not to be um, as experienced. I know this isn't the case here. Um, Sherry's worked in men's cycling for a long time, but, you know, someone who's solely worked on the Women's World Tour might have a lot to bring to men's world tour racing simply because they're not conditioned and hardwired by the same sort of dogmas that we see playing out day after day race after race that you know you can't let a break go in these circumstances or those circumstances i mean rich are there many uh, i'm trying to think of examples I, I can think of men male direct sportives that have worked in the women's world tour but i'm trying to think of someone who's gone back then and um yeah i, I mean well, what do you think of, uh, of that are, there, there are certain principles certainly Certainly, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot more aggressive racing in women's world tour, and sometimes you kind well, of wonder yeah. whether that could be, that should be applied to men's cycling a bit more. I, I mean, predominantly there are male sports directors in the women's world tour. Um, there are fewer uh, female sports directors, but one team that did come in, you know, when they launched the women's team, Trek Segafredo, um, did so with two. Um, female sports directors and and they've had an outstanding season they've been the team of the year really Um, they really hit their stride this year Um, so you know Anna van der Breggen you mentioned Lionel she will retire at the end of next year to become a a sports director with her team Um, and that's that's good to see more female sports directors in women's cycling too and and the, the journey's been been done the other way Rolf Aldag um, who's been at you know men's teams over the years went this year to Canyon Shram um, so there's no reason why there couldn't be a, a two way exchange but I think you know not 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 to say that, that men can't be sports directors in the women's world tour but um, it, it's it's good to see female sports directors in women's world tour teams um, doing well and that's certainly increasingly the case I think I mean, we should mention. I mean, we, we, there are others like Rachel Heal, you know, who's um, was a, a sports director for many years for United Healthcare. P- perhaps still is. Is she? I, I can't. I've lost. Actually, I should check on that. I think she still is. 
Well, there are, are, are well, there are others. I mean, Rachel Heal, a sports director at United Healthcare, has DS'd for the the women's and uh, men's teams over the years. We did feature her in that episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina a couple of years ago as well. Well, by coincidence, Richard, Simon Barnes, who owned and ran the Plowman Craven Madison team uh, just over a decade ago, uh, was uh, the person who hired uh, Sherry Pridham to be the sports director for the team. And uh, he runs the cycling cafe, the hub here in Not Watford, or to give it its proper name, Redbourne, and also owns a bike shop in the village. Um, no longer owns the Plowman Craven team. Uh, well, the Plowman Craven team doesn't doesn't exist anymore, but he uh, ran that team for a number of years, and they rode the Tour of Britain several times. And uh, I spoke to him about uh, Sherry Pridham, and also to James Millard, who both rode for the Plowman Craven team when Sherry Pridham was the sports director, and also worked alongside her in the team car as assistant sports director to Pridham uh, at Team Rally. She's very good. She's very focused. She's very experienced of what she did. And she has, which probably not a lot of people know, she was a very, very successful um, rider on her own account in Europe. She came from South Africa, and the only thing she wanted to do was to ride professionally as a female cyclist. And she came over to the UK from South Africa um, with... I don't do this literally, but with five pounds in her pocket, her house is full of awards from the Tour de Feminine and um, King of the Mountains and various events in the Alps and the Pyrenees. Well, I can remember the first conversation we had was uh, um, the Blackpool used to be the Blackpool Grand Prix on the Sunday and Crits on the Promenade on the Saturday, and uh, I can remember talking to her about at the Crits. It was cold. There were very few spectators, and we were just sitting talking, um, and said, "Well, you know, perhaps, perhaps next year, let's talk about it seriously." So, I'd always had respect for her, um, and uh, she, she brought a lot of young riders on. A lot of the riders that she'd taken on as young people had ended up moving up the ladder. I know, I don't know, several years, just when you, you're talking in the pits and what have you. Um, but I wasn't looking for a, a sports director at the time. But um, um, she she showed a lot of interest, and I said, "Yeah, then, well, let's let's do it." Gender didn't come into it really, to be honest. And uh, no, I didn't have any qualms at all. I didn't even think about it. Uh, well, that's that's a woman rather than a man. It wasn't it didn't go through my mind, to be honest. It was more the success that she'd had. Yeah, well, she was she was very uh, people knew where they were with her. She was very um, very firm, very clear unambiguous this is what's going to happen guys she was very decisive very decisive and didn't i don't ever remember shouting at all um but i, I remember a lot talking in a very firm way taking people to one side so this is how it is this is what it's going to be not up for discussion and uh, it was very effective I think that something that obviously struck us, it was the first time uh, for, for a lot of us that we had been uh, managed by a woman. Uh, and I think the, the, the key point that we took home from it, that there was actually no difference whatsoever, uh, as you would expect in, in, in a way. Uh, her, she was extremely professional and, uh, and everything ran exactly as it would do in any other scenario no barriers at all i think at the end of the day it's just purely about how you communicate with the riders that you're managing uh, if you can do that then it, sex is irrelevant she was uh, yeah she's very good obviously you don't survive in this game for as long as she has without being able to uh, she's able to relate both on a on a riding level and uh, and as a director uh, from her own expansive career uh, around Europe uh, in a time where it was obviously very difficult to be a, a professional female cyclist uh, so yeah she's got a lot of extra insights into a world that uh, that maybe we didn't have to live through ourselves well, just returning to Rachel Heal, who I mentioned, um, she's now at the women's team Tibco, um, but she uh, was at United Healthcare for many years, uh, DSing for the men's and women's team teams, and she did DS the men's team in Milan San Remo in 2014, um, which of course is a World Tour event. So, um, the so 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 Sherry Pridham, not the first uh, female to uh, be a sports director in a World Tour event, but 
the first to be employed by a world tour team. That's the distinction. Lionel, we heard from a couple of your neighbours there. Nice for you to um, be able to do some interviews without leaving your village. Well, yes, indeed, it was. Um, well, one of them were done on the phone, as you probably been able to tell mm-hmm. but uh, yeah i wandered up to the bike shop and had a chat with james millard and uh who, wandered who, back who can you interview from your village for next week's podcast good question i don't think anyone else uh, it, here is really relevant to the world of professional cycling oh, it doesn't matter we you know interminable interviews <laughs> is what we're after um i can thanks, do plenty thanks bob can deliver i mean bob, your, your, your tweet your tweet didn't sting at all honestly um <laughs> Uh, but it, it did uh, just, you know, it was a particularly long episode last week, so we're trying to make it a bit shorter. Give us your feedback, though, on that. Do you prefer, especially in the off-season when we're only doing one a week, do you prefer a longer episode or, or a shorter episode? Let us know. Um, it, it's good to take that kind of uh, constructive feedback on board, isn't it? Um, but we should wrap things up for this week, shouldn't we, chaps? We've got a special episode for next week. It'll really transport people back to a particular place and time um, in the cycling podcast year, we hope. And, uh, well, it sort of ties in with a recent news story as well, doesn't it, um, involving the, the BBC? But um, not say any more than that. It'll be next week's Christmas special. Are we in the Christmas mood, Daniel? Oh, very much so, Richard. Um, I'm a very festive kind of guy, as you can imagine. Yep, I'll be... Um... <laughs> I'll be draping myself no, in tinsel I, and yeah, yeah. and um, bringing a Christmas cracker to next week's episode. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Um, until then, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Lionel. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Richard.